The next thing you know, even as the Minister of National Security agreed and understood from whence he came, because he came from the Defense Force, he was head of the Defense Force, and by that appointment, he would have been a member of the National Security Council before he became minister. That's John Sandy. And he knew and he said so that the country wanted offshore patrol vehicles if we are to patrol our borders and secure it from drug runners and gun runners if we are to bring down crime and stay safe in this country. But in that argument and that desire of John Sandy, Prime Minister Kamala Prasad Bissessa get the same John Sandy to come to Parliament and say the OPVs are not required and that they are lemons and they cancel the contract and what happened? The PLM told them, if you do that, we're going to end up in arbitration. They got their spokesperson to tell us, Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, that when we cancel the contract, we will get back a billion dollars and we'll use that billion dollars to build schools and hospitals and road and to buy helicopter for to fly around the country. The PNM told them then, what you will get is a lawsuit in your person and you will have no defense. Well, I can tell you that the arbitration was going on and it has it ended? No. Have you heard anything from the government about the outcome of the arbitration? No. Well, the last thing I heard is that the government was busy attempting to enter into an arrangement where the outcome of the arbitration would remain sealed so you will never know what happened. We need no billion dollars coming here. And whatever they lost and whatever they paid, including millions of dollars to lawyers to make the AG smile. Yeah. Arbitration. And if you see how beautiful those two vessels are sailing in Brazil. Yeah. But they started off under our colors. And this government put an end to that. And the borders are still open. They're now asking for help from other countries to help us close our borders. The Prime Minister, who initially said Jack will do the right thing, could not make Jack do the right thing because she's afraid that Jack might do the wrong thing. So she had to ac accept Jack as Speaker Vice President, and of course, you know that played out. When the scandal broke at FIFA, because I warned you all that this man could get our country into disgraceful positions because of his personal business at FIFA. When the scandal broke at FIFA, the same man who couldn't give it up didn't wait until they pushed him, he jumped. And then, and then, there are people in this country who should know better, who are telling us, the man does work hard. He gets benefits for us at FIFA, so leave the man. No ethical standards, no values, and convenience as principle. That is where they were taking Trinidad and today. And I don't have the time tonight to go into the stories about him and FIFA, except to tell you as of today, they have announced in CONCACAF that this same judge from Barbados, former Chief Justice from Barbados, who is here in Trinidad doing the inquiry, has now been hired to inquire into CONCACAF. Stay tuned. Aye, aye. And I know for a fact that there are police officers who have put their signatures to statements that they were instructed to arrest people. Yes, And there, the said officers had no evidence against those persons. And they were told, arrest them and the evidence will come. There are police officers in our police service who have signed statements to that effect. What kind of country is this? When did you know that our police officers could be instructed to arrest you, your son or your neighbor? with no evidence because somebody who is as yet unidentified has told them to arrest and therefore incarcerate persons for four months. 
as if those persons have no rights. And while these are the facts, the Attorney General is saying they will not get one cent of compensation because I will use the strength of the state to fight them to the bitter end. That is the Attorney General's position. Let me read for you what pieces of legislation Volley had responsibility for. Mr. Ember told you he had um, criminal justice and he was taken away a year ago. Yes. Let me tell you what he was left with. Legislation. Criminal legislation. That was taken away. Listen what he was left with. The Criminal Injuries Compensation Act. The Justice Protection Act. The DNA Act. The Community Services Orders Act. And the Police Complaint Authority. That is what Honorable Prime Minister Kamala Prasad Bisesa created a portfolio to give Volney as Minister of Justice. So when I tell you that Volney came into this government with an agenda and an ulterior motive and the Prime Minister knew about it, think about that. Think about that. And he before, before that, he had criminal justice legislation which he saw fit to take away. And you may recall for the first year of Valdi's existence as a minister, we were asking in this country, what does Valdi do for his day's work? But with a portfolio like that, you have to have a microscope to see what he does. But he knew, and his colleagues knew, and the prime minister knew what he was working on. And the Ministry of Justice was no accidental ministry. And what has happened under Clause 34 was no error. It was a conspiracy. And we of the PNM will not be duped by any foolish talk from any quarter about the Parliament failed. Yes, we can take issue with whether or not Clause 34 should have been a part of the bill. But that requires a separate discussion. But having given the Parliament an assurance that three to four years will pass before any law of this nature comes into being, what then happened in the intervening period to cause you to want to bring it on board on January 2013? And even as you do that, you have to pull out Clause 34 and bring that into effect in August of 2012. And you see, we were told that Volney was fired for lying to the cabinet. But if a person tells a lie, it is not because they want to hear the sound of their voice. There has to be a motive behind telling the lie. Because they always have an option to tell the truth. And the fact that they told a lie, one that can get you fired and disgraced, means that there was a motive. And as we are gathered here tonight in Five Rivers Junction, or listening in the comfort of your home, we have not yet got an answer from the Prime Minister what was the motive for Volney's lying to the Cabinet. And even though you proclaim Clause 34, you talk all kind of story, but you have not told us yet what was the reason, the truthful reason for proclaiming Clause 34. has a special majority in the lower house. Don't let them fool you. They didn't need opposition votes. Three-fifths majority in the lower house is 26. They have 29. So when the Prime Minister say, if the opposition didn't vote for it, it couldn't pass, that is a lie. But in the upper house, in the Senate, they had to get independent votes if the opposition didn't support it to get the three-fifths. But look at this scenario where the Prime Minister sits in a cabinet and has a minister 
who does not have portfolio for that piece of legislation, bring cabinet notes about it, bring it to the parliament, interface with other organs of the state, including the chief justice, the director of public prosecution, the criminal bar, and the law association. The man was an imposter and the prime minister didn't know that. <laughs> and he came to the parliament and he stood up behind the prime minister and he presented the bill and the bill was passed in the lower house. And the lower house saw to it that the bill said if for 10 years they can't start your trial after you've been charged, then we agree that you should be able to make an application to the court and have the matter thrown up on the country. And of course, we went home. The next time the government, because I'm saying government here, because we are rejecting out of hand this notion that they want to sell us that Volney was a rogue minister and Volney acted on his own for which he was punished and therefore we should move on. Volney did not and could not act on his own to get this done. So when Volney went to the upper house to get the bill the act passed in the Senate, he had the position of the lower house, which was 10 years since you have been charged. But by the time Volney started to present the government's position to the upper house, he was able to tell the upper house, it is 10 years since you commit the offense. <laughs> the amnesty improved. And we asked the prime minister, and we are asking her again tonight, where did Volney get that from? Who authorized that change? And until we get the answer to that, the truthful answer, those who have been behind this conspiracy, the criminals remain in hiding. It is their intention that those questions must never be answered. It is their intention that those questions must never be asked. But it is our intention that you, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, who have been so betrayed, you must ask that question and you must get an answer. So, it comes out of the Senate, it comes back to the lower house, and you hear them saying that the opposition said nothing and we all agreed. Lie. Mr. Embert took immediate notice of it and warned them. What is this? Where did this come from? And while he was making those points and pointing out that this 10 years since you committed the crime versus 10 years since you got charged, Prime Minister said to him, we'll fix it, don't worry, we'll fix it. Because he's setting out, he's setting out to pass the framework legislation to remove preliminary inquiry, to introduce the sufficiency system. We have three to four years to go. So if you look at the Hansard, you will see Mr. Imbert recorded as taking issue with this matter. And then you will see the Prime Minister's name and inaudible. And Mr. Imbert changed his position of aggression on the point and went on. The Prime Minister sits directly opposite me. She sits directly opposite to me. The clerk didn't hear what she said. So the clerk was only able to record that the Prime Minister said something. But I knew why Imbert stopped the attack. Because she said, we fix it. And we knew we had three years. But that Prime Ministerial comment was in sync with what Senator Arawi has told the country. That when he raised this particular issue of the potential for travesty with respect to the Piaco 1 and Piaco 2 cases, which he could not raise on the parliament floor because it's forbidden, he went behind the chair with the Attorney General and an independent senator and raised the matter with the Attorney General who also gave them the assurance that we could fix it, we have time to fix it. 
it has to come back to the house. We will have time. You have to bring the rules that we demanded that must be there. We have to come back to amend another law to appoint masters. So we're looking at three or four years. So if we have to plead guilty as we must, we plead guilty to taking the words of the, of the government, words that could not be trusted. But that, that is only one part of the matter. They then went and proclaimed the act secretly in the height of the independence celebration. And they allowed persons with an interest to know about it. Long before the country knew about it, persons with an interest knew about it. So Monday morning, after the weekend holiday, persons will go before the court. And the Prime Minister makes a very deceitful statement. She says, it doesn't matter when the proclamation took place, whether it was now or three years hence, the outcome would have been the same. That is a lie. If the proclamation had taken three to four years, as it would have, as they told us in the Parliament, then those Piaco matters, there was only one left. Piaco 2 was finished. Piaco 1 was coming up in the court in a few days' time. And the early proclamation was meant to stop the preliminary inquiry that was coming up in a few days' time. And it has effectively done that. Because when the inquiry came up, after the proclamation of Clause 34, all the interested parties went straight to the court and say we cannot proceed with the preliminary inquiry because we have an amnesty in the court where we are to be freed. That was a gift from the Kamala Prasad Bissessa's government. A gift that was never anticipated by the parliament, that was never anticipated and would not have formed any part of any discussion in this country because by the time three to four years had passed, the indictments or the release would have taken place and the law would have been changed. But the DPP had said that he's waiting to indict as soon as Piaco 1, Piaco 2 was finished. Because the two cases are so close, they're called Piaco 1 and Piaco 2. And he will indict jointly. So what, what they were facing was the imminent prospect of an indictment where the trial could have begun. So they got their friends in the government to use the parliament, to use the cabinet, to use the betraying proclamation of Clause 34 to create the amnesty and they went to the court and they stopped the preliminary inquiry. And that, my friends, those are the undisputed facts. Undisputed facts. Tonight, from the quiet of Aruka Five Rivers Junction, I want, under the Integrity in Public Life Act, under the Integrity in Public Life Act, to inform the Integrity Commission that it has a duty under the Constitution to investigate the conduct or misconduct of any minister of government in Trinidad and Tobago and or any person or persons who conspire with them to do wrong. And the, the law was amended to give the commission the power to initiate that investigation on its own volition. They will find the evidence wrong. Tonight I will assist the commission by telling the commission where to look. I want the commission to go and look in the accounts of Royal Castle and see whether a check for $2.8 million was written to Ross Advertising on the 17th of December of, of May 2010. There was a general election on the 24th. 
There was a general election on the 24th of May 2010. It had come to our attention that these very people who were fighting tooth and nail to escape their day in court, they were feeding millions of dollars into the UNC campaign. And the UNC was converting that to cash and feeding it into constituencies by the millions. And in St. Joseph, millions of dollars in cash were spent in buying votes in St. Joseph. And the Integrity Commission has more power than the police. Because when the police asked you a question, you could refuse to answer. To refuse to answer the Integrity Commission is in itself a crime. In other words, you must answer. And even if you are not a public official, the Integrity Commission could demand of you your books. And they have access to the banks and the banking records in this country. So I'm telling them tonight to go to the accounts of Royal Castle on the 17th of May 2010. And they will see a check for $2.8 million signed by Steve Ferguson and and Sandy Rookchan. The check is signed by Sandy Rookchan and Steve Ferguson. It is made out to Ross Advertising. Now you may recall when the government promised pensioners their $3,000 with no questions asked. And they turn around and say, with a misspoke, and with a misdis, and a misstat. And they said it was a misprint. And they blamed Ross Advertising. And they say it's Ross who was doing the campaign, and it's Ross who make a mistake. That is the Ross who got the 2.8 million from Royal Castle. <laughs> and until until that is investigated, you will not understand the magnitude of the crime that the cabinet stands accused of. And that is that persons in the cabinet receive huge sums of money from interested parties and they got that money, they won the election, they came into office and they create this whole cacatown. And they're asking you to believe that Jimmy Henry bring 40 ram good to why the place smelling so. Standing up with us 
Because he is the leader of a political party. And we put Trinidad and Tobago first. Yes. I want to congratulate Mr. Cabrera, yes. who is also a PNM critic, but put Trinidad and Tobago first. And then I wrote to all of them and said to them, our country is in crisis. And we at the PNM, while it may fall to us, to take the lead in calling the PLM to listen and to pay attention and to respond and to push back. We will do so shoulder to shoulder yes. with anybody in this country, in yes. any organization that put Trinidad and Tobago first. There was Kirk Megu of the DNA. There was the deputy, the, the second in command of Tutor. They were all there. Alva. And there were NGOs like Fixing TNT. And of course, in the face of those facts, you have an attorney general saying it was the PNM. So he ain't going no way because his party is party that against him. When did decency escape Trinidad and Tobago? But you know, I wrote to the IRO. I haven't yet got a response. And I may not get one. Because the head of the IRO was in the church when Dean Colin Sampson spoke. And Dean Colin Sampson did not put water in his mouth as he should not. To tell the people of this country, it is his duty to call us to order when we step, around, step in the wrong right. direction. It is his duty as a canon in the church to call us to order. Regardless of your race, your religion, or your class. And I remember since the last time I checked that freedom of speech was alive and well in Trinidad and Tobago. So if the dean wants to take issue with the government, then he's free to. And if he doesn't take issue, then he's guilty of dereliction of duty. And after he spoke, the head of the IRO wasn't very pleased. So he was supposed to give the blessing. You know what that blessing is? We waiting to leave. But he took the opportunity to make a speech. Engage in the very issue that Dean Sampson addressed at the beginning. I didn't see Jack Warner taking on that as bringing Balizé House to the church. But you know what he said? In the blessing, he agreed that we should take an issue with what's going on. And he doesn't agree with any call for any firing anybody. And no need for any protest. And what we should do is mediate. I want to tell the head of the IRO tonight. It is not the intention of the PNM or the decent people of Trinidad and Tobago to mediate anything with crooks and criminals. Whether they reside in the government, outside the government, it is not our intention, our business, or our interest to mediate anything where corruption is poisoning the That's government right. and our society. That's right. Mediation has its place. Not in this situation. So I would I would be surprised if I never get a response from the IRO. But I got a response from the Joint Trade Union Movement. And I want to read it for you. Because I don't want them to listen to the to hear what it is. I want to assist them. This is written to me by Ansel Roger on behalf of the Joint Trade Union Movement. And I'll read it to you because this is a very important letter. Because this country is changing, this country is going to change, and they could run, but they can't hide. Dear Dr. Rowley, I write in response to your letter of September 19, 2012, inviting the Joint Trade Union Movement yes. to meet with you on, quote unquote, on matters of national significance. You no doubt are aware that the Joint Trade Union Movement has been very vocal and active on matters of national issues, 
as we continue to express our concerns about the blatant attack on our democracy and the crisis in governance in Trinidad and Tobago. On the issue of Section 34, we have issued a statement which called for the removal of the Minister of Justice, Honorable Herbert Barney, and the Attorney General, Honorable Anand Ramlogan. We further call for the removal of the Minister of National Security, yeah! Honorable Jack Warner, for his latest installment of boundless arrogance and disrespectful attacks on the President and the clergy for sharing their concerns about this crucial national issue. See media statement attached. We remain unimpressed and dissatisfied with the Prime Minister's response, which sought only to craft and engineer an escape avenue for the Attorney General. Yes. We stand firm that the Attorney General is culpable and must be dismissed and further maintain our call for the removal of the Minister of National Security. We were clear in our statement last week that, and I quote, should the Prime Minister fail to remove these three ministers within 48 hours, yes. then the Joint Trade Union Movement stands ready to join forces in a broad-based national front. determine the necessary mass actions towards this objective. To Since that time has expired, it is now imminent that action must be taken. Yes. Yes. Given this government's arrogant and dismissive approach, we firmly believe that it is only through a broad-based national front that the current crisis can be confronted. Any weak, divided, or separated response will fail miserably That's right. and will only strengthen the government's hands right. to continue their injustice That's against the people yes. of Trinidad and Tobago. Yes. We are also in receipt of a letter from the political leader of the movement of social justice. I'm still reading here. Comrade David Abdullah. Yeah, man. Calling for a round table meeting this week to discuss the way forward. In addition, there are several civil society groups who are either called for or are in the process of planning various activities in support of the common cause. Last night, which is Tuesday night, the, JT, the Joint Trade Union Movement deliberated extensively on these developments and in particular your invitation for discussions. Therefore, on behalf of the Joint Trade Union Movement, I wish to propose that we meet this Friday at 4 p.m. at a neutral venue. I am also proposing that we include in these discussions all the other interest groups. This is in keeping with our broad-based National Front approach and we seek to mount a series of collective mass actions yes. in defense of our democracy. Yes, we're ready! And to advance the interests of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. I eagerly anticipate an early and positive response. Yours respectfully, Ansel Roger, President General of the Old WTO, on behalf of the Joint Trade Union Movement. So when I tell you, as I've told you, that if this government believes that we are naked and defenseless, they have another thought coming. Because we, the leaders in our own right, in our own station, we will come together as citizens for Trinidad and Tobago and we will confront the evils in this government. Tonight, I can tell you, I have also been in discussions with the leader of the MSJ, who has taken the same position that has been recorded here in this letter. And I have summoned a special general council meeting of the PNM for Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, where I will put 
to the PNM General Council my proposal for treating with this development. But before that, before I go to the General Council, I will lead a team to meet with these citizens who lead important organizations in this country. I will be there on Friday at 4 o'clock. The time has come. The time has come for somebody in this country, for some people in this country to put Trinidad and Tobago first. And as leader of the PLM, I want to give you the assurance that we don't exist for our own benefit, we exist to put Trinidad and Tobago first. It's not a numbers game. It is principle. Yes. It's about values. Yes. It's about right versus wrong. Yes. So the organizing CPEP workers yes. and URP workers oh, yes. and those for whom it doesn't matter if the government does right or wrong, it is their government. That's right. Fortunately, they are in the minority. Because if they put a hundred thousand people in Mid Center Mall on Sunday, it will still have 1.2 million people who will tell them we are not accepting that and we're not there with you. And if they use the very money that they have received from the criminals and others to mobilize and put a hundred thousand people in that park on Sunday, the decent majority in Trinidad and Tobago would look at them with scorn and say, one day, one day, come put it. But it's not a numbers game. Not a numbers game. So, you know this? You have been bombarded with advertisements. Tonight, you couldn't watch your TV in peace, those of you at home. Because they bought out all the TV stations. That's the style they use in communist countries. Whether you want to watch me or not, look me. And I heard tonight the Attorney General, the man who is looking for some kind of excuse to evade his responsibility, saying that what? He is now vindicated by some statement that Patrick Manning made. The Attorney General of the UNC vindicated by Patrick Manning's statement. By Patrick Manning's nonsense. I want to know what vindication exists where the Attorney General went to the court to his lawyers on the 7th of November and told Justice Bodu Singh that everything was in place in Trinidad and Tobago for a speedy trial, a trial that would begin immediately. So therefore, don't extradite these fellas. This is the land where they must and will be tried, 7th of November based on the representation of the Attorney General's agents in the court under his guidance. The court was told that there will be a trial and the trial was imminent. And Justice Bodusing ruled in favor of the guys to remain here and be tried. Yeah. But even as Justice Bodusing was being told that, in the system, they were already scheming to put in place a law which they can create a loophole in for them not to be tried. So on the 14th of November, sorry, the 11th of November, four days later, they lay in the parliament a law with a clause which could be used to deceive the parliament, which could be manipulated, which could be proclaimed early to allow there to be no trial of these gentlemen. So by the time the bill was passed on the 19th of November, the Attorney General knew that the court had said no extradition, that the court expected a trial here, but he also knew that there was a loophole in the law that they would pass through. Because if he didn't know that, then for that and that alone, he has to be fired for falling down on the job of not being an Attorney General who discharged his duty to protect legislation. And all this 
effort to blame the opposition that he's leading the charge over. He knew he gave assurances to senators. He knew the government gave assurances to MPs in the lower house. He knew that when the proclamation came, for early proclamation, that the cabinet note was a lie. Yes. That there was no attempt in clause 34 to hire masters. He knew that an amnesty was being created. And I think some people think that he knew, that some people knew that an amnesty was coming. Yes. Have I the lawyers already? And now, it is the common understanding of all the legal experts that this matter is going to the court. And if he stays in office, this Attorney General, who is an amalgam of incompetence and or corrupt practice, if you want to choose a mixture of that amalgam, he will then be required to stay in office and put up a defense against the very conspiracy that they tried to pass through us. Let me explain that to you. There is enough evidence in the public domain that this government engaged in a conspiracy which had the effect of allowing persons not to have their day in court. And those persons happen to be interested parties and financiers of the ruling party. If it is that that is so, as I have demonstrated, how in God's name could we have the same Attorney General who is now trying to tell our children that the Office of Attorney General does not have responsibility for criminal matters and that he has no criminal experience. He is looking for a place to hide but there is no stone so big that he can hide under. The Attorney General is naked and exposed. But he now, if he remains, will be required to go to court and take argument against his own or his government's own conspiracy. Can we trust this Attorney General? This is the same Attorney General who had the decision to make on these same people's interests in the extradition proceedings who told us that he did not appeal because they had deep pockets but he told the judge that they must not go abroad yes his, his lawyers didn't argue the points yes. and the, the judge said i ruled in the favor of those who are making an application huh. and what he could have done or what he should have done knowing that the law that he was making, drafting and passing would have had this clause that they could use in the way they have used it. He should have been able to tell that to the judge. He was able to take a decision to appeal. And if he had appealed on the grounds that the legislation creates an amnesty and therefore since they could use that amnesty by virtue of the, the facts of their case, it might very well be that the judge would have ruled that they should have gone to another jurisdiction. And of course, for those who want to blame the opposition, in the law, there is Schedule 6. And as the Attorney General himself said today, if he can be believed at all, we were focusing on criminal matters. So we put all the criminal matters in for things that cannot be treated with this amnesty. But we also did something else. In the schedule, we gave the power to the minister to be able to add or remove any kind of crime that he sees fit. And all the minister had to do. And the minister, remember, is the Attorney General masquerading as Bonnie. But the law had the power in it for the minister to by order, by a stroke of a pen, to add bid rigging, money laundering, whatever they wanted. But they chose not to do that. They chose to be telling you it's a mistake.
Uh, it's a misstep. It's a fault in the parliament. They had six months they could have done that, knowing what they told the parliament, knowing what the DPP told them, knowing what cases would have been affected by this premature proclamation. One stroke of the pen would have blocked that hole under Schedule 6, and it didn't have to come to the parliament to become law. As soon as the minister signed that order, it was in effect. And it would have come to the parliament after for negative re resolution, which means that somebody in the parliament had to move a motion to stop it. And the government has the majority in the parliament, so if they brought a matter for negativing, the government's majority will prevail and the negative can happen. They didn't do that. They didn't do that. Today we stand disgraced and shamed in this country. And for all those, for all those who believe, that the AG has no question to answer. I am prepared to put the question that he had to answer on the parliament record. So on that basis, I intend in the coming hours to file a motion of censure in the parliament against the Attorney General of Trinidad and Tobago. We can only have our motions take precedence on the last Friday of the month. But that's okay. The budget is coming on Monday. And true to our responsibility to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, we will file the motion of censure and it will go there and wait until the last Friday of October. In the meantime, we will treat with the budget. That will come to an end in the middle of October. And we will return to this issue when I put on the parliament record what the Attorney General and the government of Trinidad and Tobago has done. I will read into the records in the parliament every detail of the timelines of what they have done for posterity. And when I'm through with that, I will ask them all to stand up in front of you on television live and vote for or against an attorney general so accused. And then I will ask my colleagues in the upper house to move a similar motion in the Senate. And then we'll wait to hear what the opposition says. But more interestingly, we'll wait to hear what the independents say over there. And then, if he's still there, when we walk in, if he's still there, we will let the Tobago House of Assembly move their vote of no confidence and listen to what Ashwood Jack has to say in Tobago about that. Yes. And when we would have done that, by that time, by that time, all who have eyes to see in Trinidad and Tobago and all who have a modicum of decency and all who are prepared to stand up in defense of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. If Trinidad and Tobago ever needed you, it's now. Because we are not prepared to move on and leave a government in office with the power they have in their authority and the way they've abused that power to the detriment of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. We shall not move on. We will move in our thousands. We will move with our friends. Our new friends, our old friends, our friends from long time, we will move with the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, boy and girl, man and woman. We will tell this country, stand up in defense of what is yours. It is Dr. Williams who told us, democracy is not only about what happens in the parliament and what parliamentarians do. Democracy is to be protected by you, the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And now you called upon to protect your democracy yeah. from a government that allows itself to come under the influence of people who have been charged with bid rigging and money laundering. And to have that influence cause the government to do so many things that they have to lie about. The only reason why the government cannot answer the question of why did you do that is because the truthful answer is too heinous to conceive. 
So they have to resort to lies. I was talking about corruption since Bazia Pandey became Prime Minister. I educated this country about Piaco Airport in Kojen. Remember in Kojen? Remember Ganga Singan in Kojen? You remember this Alcott? You remember the NP scandal? I spent five years, six years on the Bazia Pandey telling this country that corruption is a cancer. And we shouldn't tolerate it. But they put an ad on the radio to tell you otherwise. This is not about me. Whatever trials and tribulations I had to go through in this country was done in full public view. And you know the story. The PNM knew the story. And that is why I'm in a position today to go and sit down with those persons who lead organizations and who yes, are willing to come together security. as a defensive group for the yes. interests of Trinidad and Tobago. Yes. And I will do that without fear or favor, yes. without malice or ill will. And we support you 100. So tonight, we tell the Prime Minister in simple English, wrapping up Volney and throwing him out the window does not solve the problem. We are not fooled. Volney did not act alone. There were others in the cabinet who acted with Volney. And there were others who had the responsibility to ensure that Volney didn't do what Volney did. So therefore, we are demanding that the Prime Minister remove from our service and from use of the authority of our cabinet, Anand Ram Logan, as Attorney General of Trinidad and Tobago. And I'm asking you people, you good people of Trinidad and Tobago, from Charlottesville to Sejus, from Mayaro to Karanaj, from Karapichaima to Aruka, as we meet to discuss where we go from here, wish us well and give us your prayers. Trinidad and Tobago is at risk. I thank you very much.